My name's Paul Tyler. I'm very glad to be addressing the gay and lesbian lobby today. Uh, as I think the uh, gay and lesbian community have not got a problem. I think the, the problem is with the people who are homophobic. I think homophobia is the biggest problem and that's the problem that should be stamped out. And I think that could be done through uh, education. I think that's quite important. And uh, as I said, there, it, it's never, I've never met a smart homophobic person. Um, I compare them to the puppy dog that bumps its head on the coffee table. But there's no such thing as uh, a smart homophobic person. And these are the attitudes of other people that cause problems in your lives. And this is why I think attitudes have to be changed through education. I know that um, my daughter, who's uh, six years of age in school at the moment, uh, she, she, if she gets something on, on water wastage or whatever, she immediately changes her, her views. I can't get into a car without a seatbelt. And I think that through uh, educating the young on, on the bad practices of homophobia is, is, is vital. And I think if we can change the attitudes at a young level, I think, I think that's quite important. Uh, I, re I re read recently uh, Justice Kirby's uh, finishing uh, remarks on the gay and lesbian games, and he said, look how far we've come in 30 years. And it is remarkable uh, how far we have come in 30 years, and hopefully in the next 30 years, there will be no need for a gay and lesbian lobby, because there are all the issues, hopefully by then, will be addressed. At times, we're moving slowly as a community, but hopefully, through good policy, we can speed things up. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name's Richard Wynn, and I'm the uh, sitting member at the moment for the seat of Richmond, and uh, I represent the Australian Labor Party. The Australian Labor Party stands for an inclusive and tolerant society. And when it comes to issues around gay, lesbian, and transgender community, I would say the Brex government has got the score on the board. I had the uh, pleasure of working with probably the government's strongest advocate for social justice in Rob Hulls. Uh, as the Attorney General, he has taken a leadership role and stood up against some of the, some of the worst excesses in the community that people have in relation to uh, gay, lesbian and transgender issues. I, as his Parliamentary Secretary, have had the pleasure of working with, uh, I think, some of the finest and most talented people in the community uh, who have taken an interest in gay, lesbian and transgender issues and uh, chaired an advisory committee on Rob's behalf for the last three years. When that committee started its journey, I guess many of us were not quite sure how we would actually end up. But it, it's fair to say that uh, three years on, we have fundamentally changed the way uh, people in this state respond to issues around gay, lesbian and transgender people. We have, we have righted an, an historic wrong. An historic wrong uh, that was inflicted on people on the basis of their sexuality. And I'm incredibly proud of that, and I'm incredibly proud of what uh, the Labor Party have done in that respect. I referred to, the, firstly, the first thing we did, of course, was to ensure that uh, people in the transgender community were no longer discriminated against uh, in terms of employment. And I well remember the, uh, the, the debate that occurred uh, in the Parliament around that and some of the interesting negotiations we had to go through because, as you're all aware, we, we are a minority government and we had to seek the support of uh, two independents, at, uh, at least two independents at that stage, and can I say I was delighted that we actually had a piece of legislation uh, that was passed uh, uh, with the support of all three independents, which was no mean feat, I might say, which is really a precursor to the most uh, fundamental changes, most sweeping changes that were made by the Brax government, which was the uh, Statute Law uh, Amendment Bill which went to the very heart of discrimination at the most basic level of people's lives who live in same uh, sex relationships. Uh, things around property, things around superannuation. Uh, uh, if your partner was sick, you previously didn't have the opportunity, or in fact legal right, uh, to uh, access uh, their uh, medical support staff when they were in hospital. The most fundamental levels of discrimination were inflicted upon same-sex uh, partners, and we changed that. And I'm really proud of what the government did in that respect. 57 pieces of legislation were changed over, over two tranches of debate in the Parliament. And can I say, it took us some time to get the Liberal Party on board. I mean, that's the truth of the matter. 
There were some like-minded people, and there's no doubt about that, in the, in the Liberal Party. But I have to say, uh, the Liberal Party generally were quite resistant uh, early on to the changes that we were proposing. Fortunately, I think with, uh, with education and with lobbying, we did achieve uh, very good outcomes and got those uh, two tranches of legislation through. But there's more work to be done, and uh, we know that, and we will continue to work with the, uh, with the uh, Attorney General's Advisory Committee and with that incredibly talented group of people uh, to ensure that the further reforms that uh, we'll no doubt discuss today uh, are in fact uh, enacted. For me, seeing those pieces of legislation go through the Parliament, and I've said it before, I remember that when that first tranche of legislation went through, it was an incredibly exciting night because it was very, very late at night. It was an incredibly tense, uh, a tense time. Lots of debate and lots of argument leading up to the actual vote. And I remember many of the uh, members of the lobby came into the um, dining room of the parliament. And I think there was this sort of sense of euphoria that this fundamental change had occurred and this discrimination was no longer a part of people's lives. And I remember driving home and I was sort of slight, I hadn't drunk anything, but I was actually slightly intoxicated because you, you had this sense of, well, that actually, this is what government's about. It's about changing laws that discriminate against people. So as I was, I was sort of driving home on this sort of rather weird high of, of saying, well, that's a fantastic thing, and that's something that the Brexit government and I am really very proud of. Thanks very much. Uh, of 
of uh, really where I think her uh, her, uh, her policy position is, and uh, that was great. So, and I think the role of the uh, of the uh, liaison officers is a manifestation of that, and that's great. Just a question on um, referral of powers. Yes. Uh, property disputes of married couples at the moment are currently resolved in the Family Court of Australia. Um, the Commonwealth Attorney General has invited the states to refer their powers uh, in relation to unmarried couples to the Family Court as well uh, at Commonwealth level, um, so that they can also deal with the disputes, property disputes of unmarried couples. Now, the Commonwealth has said that it only wants those powers for straight unmarried couples. Will you promise to insist that no referral goes ahead, no referral happens, unless it goes ahead on a non-discriminatory basis and covers both straight and same-sex couples? Let me start with you, Joe. Um, yes, certainly we will we, we, um, promise to support that and clearly uh, any referral of powers would only be acceptable if it was one that was um, the same no matter whether it is a, a same-sex or a heterosexual couple. There needs to be um, non-discriminating practices at every level and we wouldn't, we wouldn't support any transfer of powers if it was under a current system or one that um, means that there was a different way that people were treated in that kind of proceeding based on their sexuality. Uh, I would have to say, um, Big Perkin is working very hard to get to lead the referral of powers here, and he's also, um, I, know, I know he's going to come up later uh, with Daryl Williams, he's also working very hard to educate him. Nicely put the face, Governor, and indeed the, the Attorney General has, uh, well, Hales has made it absolutely clear we will not be referring those powers. Uh, because they are simply, uh, as they can't exist, they're homophobic and exclude a section of the community and they're discriminatory. We will not uh, support the referral. Absolutely not. And the Attorney General has campaigned strongly on this. Okay. Um, following on from the Equal Opportunities Report, uh, same-sex relationships in the law, the Bratz government referred to the Law Reform Commission the uh, question of access to assisted reproductive technology and of adoption for safe-sex couples. Um, this is a difficult question for you all. The Law Reform Commission, as I said, is reviewing adoption and assisted reproductive technology laws. Will your party, and will you individually, guarantee that the principles of equality and non-discrimination will be the major influences on your consideration of any recommendations that arise from that report? Sure. Um, but beyond waiting for the recommendations of the report, the Greens actually have it very clearly in our state policy that uh, we feel that those um, rights should be there now and that there should be the access to assisted reproductive technologies and, and um, adoption for same-sex couples regardless of uh, waiting for a procedure. We've been waiting for a long time for this to happen and I think that um, certainly the, as it stands at the moment with the, the laws in Victoria, the fact that lesbian women who wish to um, have assisted reproductive technology travel to Audrey where they're paying $800 to do that um, because just because they are in Victoria at the moment is something that urgently needs to address, be addressed. Uh, it's something that we'd like there to be debate on before the election and we certainly think that it's something that we feel quite strongly about in terms of equal access that should be available now and we really do call on the other parties to do that. Um, I think we need to remember that Brats called lesbian women socially infertile and that's something that um, has not really been addressed even in last week's uh, Herald Sun article where these questions were raised. There were just many ALP members who did not answer or said that they would wait for the outcomes and we'd like to see principled answers on what we think is the, um, the stance on the issues now. Once again, um, just for <laughs> uh, no, once again, uh, I think the key word to that is, is guarantee. Uh, once again, the Liberal Party are working towards uh, an equal opportunity basis, but to guarantee it, to absolutely guarantee it, here today, any of the parties, I think, would be, uh, I, I could not guarantee it.
so I can't have to say no. I think, so just, just to clarify, the question is not, not whether you would accept um, the recommendations if they were to allow access, but to guarantee that the principles underlying any decisions that you might make about those recommendations would be inspired by non-discrimination and equality? Oh, yes, 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 they would be. Sorry, really. Well, the principles are not a question, and we should, we should, uh, we should also remember it was uh, the former government which, uh, which abolished the Law Reform Commission. It's the first government that reinstated it. Uh, it was a, recommenda a strong recommendation of the Attorney-General's Gay and Lesbian Advisory Committee that the matter of IVF and adoption be, uh, that there be a, a review and a reference to the Law Reform Commission. That was done. It was done in October. It is with the independent Law Reform Commission, uh, Professor, Professor Marcia Neve, I think is probably one of the most qualified people, certainly in this country, to undertake that review. Uh, we want that review to be undertaken and we'll look at the outcomes. Okay, until 1981, uh, consensual sex between men was a criminal offence. Mm -hmm. Um, indeed, even one man asking another man for sex was a criminal offence as well. Now, as a result, many now older men have the stigma of um, a criminal record for such offences. Will you support a process to remove these criminal records well, and to atone for the human rights um, violations that they represent? Yeah, this is a question about spent convictions. That's right. And uh, it, it, it is a matter that has been uh, raised with the Attorney General's Advisory Committee and I think it's something that we should uh, very actively consider in the next term of government. Uh, it, it strikes me that, uh, uh, that this, this area of discrimination should be expunged from people's records. I mean, that's my instinctive response, but I think it's a matter that uh, should be, should be, that uh, I should probably take advice if I'm still uh, uh, one elected and secondly working with Rob Holes mm -hmm. in the future, that we would take, again, the advice of our advisory committee on that. Uh, and um, seek to provide uh, expert advice to the attorney on it. But I would, uh, that would be my instinctive position, absolutely. Well, I think you can look at things and take advice and all that, but I, I actually only found out about this today. Um, unfortunately, I, pardon my ignorance, I can't believe after 13 years of the Labor government and seven years of the Liberal government that this hasn't happened. And, and once again, I can't make any guarantees, but I, I think it's something that should be changed. And I, if I am elected, I will be definitely working hard to do that. Um, the Greens um, certainly believe that it should be changed and the convictions should be um, wiped out immediately. We don't think it needs to go to any kind of advisory committee, but it's quite clear in our policy that we think it's something that should be addressed and should happen and certainly something that is, um, it's incredibly um, sad that that discrimination is still there for those people in our community and it's really something we think is very important and should be addressed immediately. Um, <coughs> as most of you would know, the, the Ministerial Advisory Committee on Lesbian and Gay Health has just released a, a health action plan which has substantial research papers. Um, some of the issues that have come out of that is that it proposes to create a special unit uh, or centre to, to look at the lesbian and gay issues, but one of the recommendations was um, that transgender people's birth certificates uh, be able to be changed to reflect their gender. And bearing in mind the problem and the, the distress that this causes the people, um, what's your personal view and what is your party's view? And um, we really we, we'd like some sort of strong commitment to this because it's, it's something that's been hanging around for a long time. Um, this is a, a, another area that is quite clear in our policy and obviously that I feel quite strongly about. We think that there should be that ability to have that change to birth certificates for transgender people. Um, and we also think that another area that um, needs to be addressed and that we've been working on and speaking about with our members and people in the community is also the um, other issue of lesbian parents and having two women on birth certificates for when they are co-parents of a child and that's something else we think needs to be looked at as well but certainly on the issue of transgender people we strongly commit to that and it's clear in our policy. The Liberal Party is also looking at changing birth certificates. So. And do you, if, if you're elected will you actively campaign? <coughs> yes, I will. That yes. Changing yes, I will, yeah. We've been actively working on the issue of birth certificates <coughs> through the advisory committee. We think that it is possible administratively 
to resolve this question with our legislation. Uh, and we're in the throes of that, we're in the throes of that discussion uh, very actively um, as the election drew upon us. But I think there is a reasonably uh, strong chance that we could in fact do it uh, through an administrative arrangement as opposed to legislation, which would, would achieve the outcome that I think the transgender community has been seeking for a long time.
Yeah. Yeah, no, sorry. Um, if you're elected DMA, will you seek to see those committees continue in their broad consultation and, and input into policy? Sure. Um, certainly, I think the establishment of those committees has been a good initiative and one the Greens will support. But I think more broadly, um, what the Greens are about is ensuring that there's dialogue between the formal parliamentary structures that we set up and the issues of people in the community. So whilst, of course, we would support those what bodies, we would also support grassroots um, liaison with both peak gay lesbian bodies but also with communities. And if I was to be elected, working with the community here and the election in Richmond would be a way that I would ensure that those issues were at the forefront of the things that I did in Parliament. And that's not to say that the formal bodies aren't important, but I think that we need to be very broad in the way that we work with all the communities we seek to represent, and we need to do that in a multiple strategy kind of way. So, yes, we would support that, but I think we need to look through a lot more to make sure the voices of ordinary people um, are heard in Parliament. I, I really don't know our policy on whether we would continue with those two review committees, but uh, I know that nothing has been said that we would stop them. Okay. As an individual member, will you... <coughs> I would like to advocate that both the committees are good, provided the committees, I mean, they're, they're set up for a reason, hopefully they're uh, getting some results. Well, we'd like them eventually, obviously, to, to be disbanded if there's nothing else to do. Yeah, exactly. Let's hope they die on board, and yes. Yeah, but the sand is going to be issued by anything. Exactly. <laughs> Uh, these work committees set up by the British government, they've been extraordinarily successful, both of them. Uh, the, the Attorney General's group, uh, I think is, uh, I'm suppose I'm a bit biased, David, they're uh, probably the most talented group of people I've ever, I've ever had to work with, and just extraordinary group of people. Uh, they do provide not only high-level advice to the government, but they also go, to pick up Yemen's point, they actually go back to their constituent units because uh, people come to the community representing various interest groups, whether it's a transgender community, the, the gay and lesbian lobby, uh, or a whole range of other groups. Uh, so that we've drawn together, I think, a really interesting group of people with different but very complementary skills, uh, which provides great advice um, to the government around, well, in, in the circumstance of the committee I work with around uh, law reform and, as I, as I said in my introduction, I think the score's on the board in terms of that work, mm -hmm. with more to be done. Now, starting with Gemma again, in terms of... Um, yeah, Gemma. 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 <laughs> Sorry, Gemma. 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 Okay. Um, in terms of your role as, as an elected representative, assuming yeah. you're elected, um, what do you think you can do in terms of bringing pressure in the federal sphere? There's a number of issues, but most importantly, immigration and superannuation, sure. which the federal government steadfastly refuses to engage, to discuss, uh, other than to continue to discriminate. So, how can you add to our efforts in terms of getting some dialogue there? Mm -hmm. um, I guess what the Greens um, uh, have to offer in terms of our local um, campaign and the party here in Victoria is a very strong link with our federally elected members. Uh, we have two senators now and our new lower house member from Wollongong, Michael Organ, and certainly I would commit to working strongly with those three members of federal parliament to ensure those issues are on the, um, the front of our list of priorities. We have a very comprehensive federal policy that covers issues important to gay, lesbian, transgender, intersection, bisexual people, and the intersex part of our policy is actually the first intersex policy in the world, we believe, um, which is something we're very proud of. And I think that at a federal level, certainly we're only three members of federal government, but um, federal parliament, but we would ensure that um, there was a dialogue between our representatives here in Victoria and those in, in Canberra. So it was immigration and what? Immigration and superannuation, basically to give people a bit of background viewers, um, a different set of rules and laws apply. With superannuation, for example, a same-sex partner, if you leave your superannuation to that partner, it is taxed, mm -hmm. as opposed to a partner of the opposite sex where it's not taxed. And immigration, there is no specific right in the immigration laws that allow a same-sex partner to immigrate to Australia. Well, well, having spoken once again uh, to Victor Perkin, who is our spokesperson in, in the Liberal Party for the state issues, uh, we are we are committed to heading towards uh, those reforms in statewide. But you must remember that is a, a federal issue. But we will be doing all we can to convince our federal colleagues of the necessity of these reforms. Well, from obviously from the Labor Party's perspective, we. Uh, 
we would support uh, a, a position that resolves those questions. I mean, it is in line clearly with our state position, which is one of anti-discrimination uh, on all grounds. Uh, these are these are quite significant hurdles that we have still have further work to uh, to go on. But the the ideal opportunity for us to do that is to take the leadership role which we held on so many of these law reform issues through what's called the Standing Committee of Attorney, uh, Attorney SCAG. SCAG, thank you, thank you. It's a great service, it's, it's a great service, it's SCAG. SCAG. Standing Committee of Attorney Generals, which uh, meets on a quarterly basis and these sorts of issues do get knocked around and, uh, and try to seek a resolution of those and I can't think of a better advocate on those issues than Rob Hulls. I was going to ask a question on the homosexual advanced defence, but I'll actually leave that catch in the front of one here. Okay. Um, Palestine, currently in Victoria, the law of provocation is the concept of the homosexual advanced defence, which basically allows people who, who kill gay men to get their uh, charge reduced from murder to manslaughter, or manslaughter on the basis that the victim made a sexual advance uh, and that somehow their, their, rea their reaction was justified um, on the basis of, you know, some sort of embedded homophobia. Now, as well as being um, unbelievable that this is actually in our laws and being taught in our law schools, it also allows, uh, allows people to play on the prejudices and indeed homophobia of the jury. Um, what would you do to actually, not, not only talking about, you know, abolishing, abolishing the defence itself, but minimising the degree to which a jury can actually express such sort of homophobic um, responses with regards to accused people from that. The Law Reform Commission is at this very moment currently reviewing mm -hmm. the, uh, this matter. Uh, I had the circumstance in fact to deal with the person who was the uh, surviving victim of an extraordinary uh, and brutal attack on a um, on a um, homosexual uh, person in the, um, the gardens over here in um, Exhibition Gardens, a case that you'll all be very well aware of. And um, it was the most horrific uh, assault which actually uh, ended in a uh, this person's partner being killed. And uh, it, uh, it struck me that, uh, that this really was not only an example of the most vicious attack upon, uh, upon two innocent people who were in fact going about their lawful business, walking home at, uh, at night, but to, for this uh, defence to be still a part of uh, the criminal law, is, it was really one of the motivations in fact why this matter was referred. Um, and we again seek the expert advice of uh, Marcia Neve and even her colleagues and uh, we'll um, be really very keen to get that advice. Well, I think hopefully the Law Reform Commission will come through with the right answer. It, it should be uh, struck out as a defence. I, I think, it, it, once again, it, it deals with homophobia and fear. It gives people, I suppose, an unfair advantage. And, and I'm talking about the alleged criminal. Um, uh, obviously, if there, is a, a, uh, if there is sexual fear, either heterosexual or homosexual or whatever, that has to be established. But if it's just purely on the grounds of either homosexual fear or based on homophobic fear, I should say, um, then it should be struck out. And I would hope that the Law Reform Commission could come up with the, the right answer and to strike it out. Well, the Greens believe that the defence should be struck out, and we certainly also believe that um, the partial defence of provocation is also of concern for women in the way that it's used against women as well, and that's something we look at in our women's policies too. And I've had a lot of debate about in terms of the way that's been used against women, um, and particularly in uh, relationship disputes and that kind of thing. But we certainly think it should be struck out. On your other part of your question about juries, I think that what that goes to is much broader need for community education around homophobia, and that certainly I think is a concern that needs to go beyond the specific um, legal instance here of the defence, but in terms of much broader work around homophobia and, and raising community awareness, um, which obviously goes to much broader concerns around schooling, education and attitudes in society that we all need to challenge and be vigilant around.
Uh, recently, uh, the Minister for Health, John Quates, released a, a statewide HIV AIDS strategy. Um, basically, well, HIV doesn't just affect gay men, it disproportionately affects gay men. Uh, more than basically any other part of society now. People with HIV are living longer, but they're continuing to experience difficulties with treatment side effects and managing the illness. Um, I'm going to start with Gemma. Will your party continue to support the active participation of HIV positive men and the organisations established to represent their health interests in overcoming HIV? Of course we will continue to support that and I think that questions more broadly around supporting um, funding for health and uh, funding for the critical issue of HIV AIDS are important. Um, our health policy is around community health uh, and making sure that health um, needs can be addressed at that very local level for the community and appropriate health. And I think that ensuring that um, that is a well-funded part of what government has to offer is critical and certainly we will support that. And the Liberals uh, intend to improve the health policy and that will be a non-discriminatory health policy and that will include AIDS and HIV. I think probably more than any other health minister in the last decade, John Swates has, has played a real leadership role in ensuring that uh, funding uh, is specifically targeted to uh, uh, HIV AIDS related issues and uh, in relation to uh, particularly uh, providing opportunities through the, uh, his advisory committee for high level advice to government which is not only just advice, and I take the point of my colleague here that uh, we have lots of committees, indeed we do, because you, have, you need to listen to what people have got to, uh, got to say, uh, but also to actually put targeted money into, into HIV and AIDS related uh, programs and support structures uh, has been a key, a key legacy of our first term in government. Mm -hmm. I think we'll go to questions from the floor now. I'm sure there's lots of people that are anxiously waiting. And uh, uh, when you ask a question, if you could please uh, stand up. And if you wish to identify yourself, please. And address your question to the So, thanks, David. Question to all three candidates, and or two, two if I may, and they're very quick in relation, supplementary in relation to birth certificates. Will each candidate um, urge heavily for a meeting directly between transsexuals and officials within the Department of Births, Deaths and Marriages? And furthermore, will each candidate um, commit to working on a cross-partisan, non-political approach on the issue of birth certificate reform? Yes. Yes, Ellie, as you know, I mean, we were well advanced in that work. Uh, the elections interrupted that. We want to get back onto that agenda. You know that, and uh, we're committed to that. Rare agreement. Excellent. John. Um, this year, we uh, had the, as Dave's already uh, spoken to, we had the launch of the HIV AIDS strategy. Now, my question is for all three of you. Um, that is the first really formal document that outlines a series of priorities and vision for managing HIV AIDS in the state of Victoria. It's never happened before. What I'm asking all of you is, do you give an undertaking to lobby on behalf of implementing the key strategies of that document? It's all very well to have a document like that, but it comes up with a whole series of recommendations around specifics in terms of health issues and management. Would you lobby to make sure that those strategies are implemented? Uh, my question is just for Paul. 
Paul, as a Liberal Party member, what initiatives have you seen and what initiatives would you like to see from the State Liberal Party to moderate the homophobic policies of the Federal Liberal Party? <coughs> uh, okay, I don't think that the uh, <laughs> Federal Party is homophobic, thank you. I think some of the perhaps uh, slip of the tongue comments uh, appear to be homophobic, but, uh, so, but what I would say is... <laughs> But what I would say is that I think that the team that we've got in the Liberal Party in Victoria, and once again I say Andrew, Andrea Coop, Peter Katsabas, Leonie Burke and Andrew Alexander, they've been working very hard. We, we don't accept any homophobia. Well, we, we try and stand it out if, if we do see it. And I, I can tell you now, if, if there is any uh, homophobia, people will be spoken to about that. I, I know you're trying to trick me with that question about the Federal Party, but I don't... <laughs> Federal Party are homophobic, um, and if there is any homophobia present, uh, I'm sure the people that I've just mentioned will have uh, direct consultation and further consultation. Supplementary, Chris, or please, Chris? Uh, perhaps then, if I reframe the question in terms of what initiatives have you seen and what initiatives would you like to see to moderate policies at a federal level which openly discriminate against lesbians and gay men? I would say that uh, that team, which, which I am unfortunately not a part of, I'm, I'm not elected member of parliament, but uh, I think they have been working well. They, they, they will be doing all they can, uh, along with my, my Victor Burton, who has had a heap of mentions today, but they're all working hard. We, we do want to stand out any homophobic uh, opinions or, or even laws. Um, just remembering that uh, there was a Hawke competing government, uh, uh, you know, things do occasionally take time. Um, and, and I know, I know, that's a But look, we will be working hard to stand out any homophobic opinions or whatever. To Dick Wynn. Um, I, I think probably I was the only one here who, when the question was being asked about discrimination in schools, a lump was forming in my throat. And I was actually really surprised to see that the Liberal candidate's answers seem to have greater understanding of the situation of gay students in schools. Because it's not just about more resources for schools. The real cause of the discrimination is the pervasive homophobia in our culture. And I think both of the major parties, at their leadership level, are constantly responsible for that. Steve Brax is the man who described lesbians as socially infertile and who only a few days ago was telling the Herald Sun that he didn't think it was appropriate for IVF access, assisted reproductive technology access to be given to the gay community, didn't believe it was appropriate for adoption rights to be given to the gay community. Now I find that deeply homophobic and I'm wondering, would you be a member of a government which passed or had similar attitudes to a particular race if a government said that IVF access shouldn't be given to black citizens, that adoption wasn't appropriate for black citizens, that it was appropriate for religious schools to discriminate against black citizens. I'm sure you'd see that as highly discriminatory, and yet those are the homophobic attitudes perpetuated in the mainstream culture by the senior members of your government. And if you wouldn't accept that kind of language about race, what's the big difference which makes it okay for those things to be said in really public forums rather than these private pictures to the gay and lesbian community? What's the difference between issues of race and gender that makes that acceptable? Well, can I say I reject that analysis, and what I would say to you is this. Go and look at the scorecard over the last three years. Look at the fundamental reforms that the Brax government, that the Brax government has initiated for the gay and lesbian community to address fundamental discrimination against gay and lesbian people. 57 pieces of legislation go to the very core of the way that people live in this community have been changed. That discrimination has been changed by the Brax government. Not by a Liberal government. Not by a Liberal government. For seven years, the Liberal Party did nothing to right that fundamental wrong against gay, lesbian and transgender community. I say to you, go look at the scoreboard, and when you look at that scoreboard, I think it's a pretty good result. A pretty good result with more to be done. You talk about IVF and adoption, and I say to you, we have referred it to the Law Reform Commission. It was a policy, it was a policy principle that we went to the election with, and we have achieved that outcome. So I reject the fundamental basis on which you make that statement. Uh, so do you 
accept the premise that the real, or one of the key problems for people growing up in this community is the cultural homophobia. And when the Premier says to the Herald Sun, it's not appropriate for children to be growing up in gay families. And when we continue to have laws, so for instance, my partner is a school teacher every time he applies for a job, has to hide his sexuality because it's still lawful in the private school system to discriminate against teachers on the basis of their sexuality. That is a powerful legislative lesson to students. It is okay to discriminate. It's not okay for gay people to be teaching children. And that seems to be a pretty fundamental rejection of our community to me. Well, okay, that's your view, and I, and, but I would put to you that there are key people within the government and the government, the government leadership and the executive of this government who have implemented those changes, starting from the Premier and the Cabinet, and you have no stronger advocate for gay, lesbian and transgender issues in this Parliament than the Attorney-General Rob Holes, and I would say with some modesty myself. Yes. Uh, my name's Garrett, I'm from Pride Watch, Victoria. In the past, and as recently as last week, as referred to with the remarks about lesbians being socially infertile, and the remark you made, Paul, about slips of tongue by members of political parties, um, can we get a commitment from all three of you and your parties to, um, to avoid using language that discriminates against us and that, um, in effect, doesn't include us in the wider human family, and to not only avoid that, but to use language that does include us, and to call to account members of your parties who do use language that we find offensive. <laughs> I definitely agree with what you're saying. If I'm elected, I will be a, a local member who will be a backbencher, but I would definitely be uh, lobbying for that. I, I, I think any slip of the tongue or uh, any wrong statement like that should be corrected and, um, and it, it also it perhaps should be punished. Uh, I don't know how, what forms of punishment you should have, but it should be brought out. Yes. The first little uh, politician you like to put in the stocks, eh? Line them up. Okay, but that, that's what I would say. So I would suggest to you that, yes, I, I think that, that's a, a, a great suggestion and it, and it should be implemented, yes, on both sides of Parliament, yeah. Um, look, I think that certainly um, as both someone running for election or as an elected member of Parliament, you've got a responsibility to challenge discrimination and challenging homophobia is part of that. And within the Greens, it's something that um, certainly I will commit to do and it's quite clear in our policy in terms of encouraging a um, inclusive and non-discriminatory party in terms of how we operate internally. Um, we have two um, queer people running for Parliament in this state election in Victoria, which we're very proud. And I think that obviously ensuring that we challenge discrimination, homophobia, um, hetero, you know, centric language wherever we see it, is something that we can also have part in and something that certainly I search to do. Well, there's no place for that sort of language, uh, and there's no place for homophobia. And I just want to pick up on the earlier point that was made, that there may have been some uh, suggestion of uncomfortableness within the Labor caucus around uh, uh, the reform agenda, which the Attorney-General and I have pursued uh, for uh, in particular relation to the statute law amendments. Uh, I can absolutely assure you that there was a completely unanimous view within the Labor Party supporting uh, the reform package which went through the Parliament. A completely unanimous view. Just a quick follow-up question. Um, I would be remiss if I didn't ask you this, but can we expect to see the three of you and your leaders at Pride March on the 2nd of February next year? Uh, you will certainly see me there. You will certainly see John Thwaites there as a local member of Parliament uh, for... Um, John Thwaites, the Premier. John Thwaites, the local member of Parliament for Albert Park. Uh, and you, assuming I get elected as well, and uh, you will certainly um, see the Attorney General there. Uh, I can't make the commitment. Assuming the Attorney General is the Attorney General. <laughs> 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 uh, I, I can make the commitment. I'll, I'll be there next February. Uh, if I can't speak to my leader, I haven't asked him. I will ask him. Yes? I've been before and I'll go again. We're going to to take in celebrations of our um, community. So, yeah. 
we've got time for two more questions, uh, then we, two or three questions, then we need to close. Um, um, my question is firstly to the Liberal candidate and then to the Greens candidate. Given that uh, every member of the National Party voted against the Relationship Bill, would you support the Liberal Party going into coalition with the National Party? And to the Greens candidate, uh, would you give your preferences to the Liberal Party, knowing full well that they may enter into a coalition with the National Party and uh, you would have a government in which uh, those views were uh, held sway? Yeah, sure. Look, our, our plan is to leave the, the state outright. And the Liberals want to win enough seats to form a government without coalition. And, and uh, I think Rob Doyle was asked that question on the, the debate, and he said his plan is to leave the state with just Liberals. So we, we, we haven't even discussed uh, having a coalition with the Nationals at the moment. I can't expect to go without getting questions about questions at the moment, so... Um, um, look, I guess for the Greens, um, as many of you may know, we do decide our preferences uh, area by area. Here for the elected Richmond, we have a working party of our membership that is determining how our preferences will be allocated, and we certainly won't be preferencing the Liberals. Um, they'll be put last on our ticket. Uh, certainly, um, there has been a lot of debate around issues around the environment and the ALP's performance, and some of our regional electorates are concerned about preferencing the ALP because of particular concerns they have around the lack of the promises that were broken by the ALP government to basically end logging in the state. And that's a debate that will go on throughout the campaign. We certainly are not saying that we're preferencing Liberals anywhere in the state. Um, but at this point there are some seats where we may not direct preferences to the ALP. That's the decision of the party, not of me as a candidate. But I can certainly say that um, in, in my electorate we'll be putting the Liberals last and I certainly would be very concerned about um, any any implication that we want to support a party that I do believe um, has views that are very questionable around sexuality matters. I'd like to thank everyone for coming today and also the Builders Arms for the use of this yes. space. Um, both uh, Catherine and myself wish all the candidates well. Um, hope that uh, you're on roll to vote and that you're all going to do the right uh, on the 30th of November. And um, best of luck to everyone and, and thanks for everyone for attending today.